The Unshackled Waves, Episode 69. Hello and welcome to the Unshackled Waves podcast. I'm Tim Wilms, back for another In Focus show. And just a reminder about the format, this is when we bring in an expert on a topic so we can all learn a bit more about it and so we can be better versed in the subject matter. Our guest for today is Dr. Alan Moran. He's the founder and director at Regulation Economics, which is an Australian think tank promoting uh, economic deregulation. He's also a board member at the Australian Environment Foundation. He's a contributor to Cadillacy Files. He has regular op-eds published in major Australian newspapers. He was director at the deregulation unit at the IPA for 18 years, focusing on energy and environmental issues. He has also advised federal and state governments on energy and competition policy. He has published numerous books, uh, most recently uh, Climate Change Treaties and Policies in the Trump Era by Connor Court Publishing. So we thought we'd invite uh, Alan on today to discuss the climate change phenomenon and the current state of climate policy. So Alan, welcome to the show. Hi, Tim. Now we'll start from there because climate change is it's quite a complex topic, but we'll start Uh, as I always like to do right at the beginning, where did the the climate change narrative, I won't call it a consensus because it's not, where did it originally come from? What's its history up until now? Well, the association of carbon dioxide and and warmer temperatures uh, goes back over a century. I uh, work from a a, a scientist called Aris, um, who who had made that association, but it lay dormant for a long while. Uh, and indeed, uh, until about the 1970s, late 1970s, I guess, um, the issue generally or the concerns in climate was that whether we were facing a new ice age. And uh, indeed, many of the scientists who have become uh, global warming warriors previously were warning about that we are entering a new, new, new ice age. The issue became much stronger in the minds of many scientists uh, from about the, the uh, mid-1960s when there was some warming taking place. And there were various international meetings uh, which examined this and which debated it uh, ac- across uh, m- many different, uh, different geographical areas. Um, at the same time, other things had been in, in, the, in the whole wash of these international agreements, not on climate, but on things like um, uh, acid rain uh, and the ozone layer, where nations had gotten together um, in, the, in the period since uh, World War II to actually make uh, agreements uh, to desist in certain activities. Uh, in that case, in the case of acid rain, it was sulfur dioxide emissions into the atmosphere. In the case of ozone, it was the hydrochlorofluorides, hydrochlor- HFCs, um, in, uh, through, uh, which were pretty important in, in air conditioning, for example. So we had these these uh, fairly interesting, uh, almost unique uh, occurrences in the post-1945 era where nations took issues, issues uh, and collectively agreed to do things which were individually harmful to them, if you like, in the economic sense. Uh, if you, for example, when uh, if we wean ourselves, as we have, off the ozone-depleting substances, there is some cost involved. Uh, and that was the case with, uh, with SO2 as well. Uh, some, the, neither of those two were very serious matters, um, and indeed the SO2 one has now proven to be totally unbounded. But there is no uh, acidification of the forests or the lakes and things, which was, which was the begetter of that issue. Uh, but but nonetheless, um, meetings and and, uh, and decisions were taken, and governments confirmed those decisions. But the the global warming uh, issue came in looms much much larger. Uh, this is a major cost to economies. In the in the end, uh, global warming or combating it, if it is due to carbon dioxide, means a very serious uh, reconstruction of industries. Uh, in particular, energy industries, 
And in particular, the energy industries in those countries like Australia, which are, uh, are very high quality and very low cost, uh, largely because we have here a lot of easily retrieved coal. Uh, and so uh, we, we, the, the foundation of the electricity industry in Australia, for example, was based on uh, cheap coal uh, and uh, it enabled us to get an electricity industry as cheap or probably cheaper than anywhere else in the world. So the issues came there and, and, and culminated in various meetings in Rio and uh, there was a meeting in Stockholm which worked very well where our, our very own Kevin Rudd in 2009 was to everybody but it collapsed in the end because the, the meeting, uh, the, the developed countries all agreed to do things but it was contingent on the developed countries doing things as well and India and China uh, got together and said no they were going to have a bar of it so it collapsed. So we got then the Obama administration and uh, uh, and a, a gradual agreement up until the uh, December 2015 Paris Agreement, which was to solemnify all of these uh, agreements and, and whereby every country uh, more or less agreed to reduce their emissions of carbon dioxide and similar goods, similar gases. Uh, the, the only ones that did so, of course, in, in that earlier period, uh, in, in the period before 2030, and the tech to do so before there, were the developed countries, which are about 45% uh, or 40% of the world's emissions. The others, uh, the others, uh, but not starting until 2030. So that's how we, uh, that's how, that's how the background of it all was, was these international agreements, uh, where by which we should pave the way to agreements with teeth in them. In the past, it was always thought that if an international agreement uh, was in place as a treaty or whatever, it would last only as long as countries saw it in their interest to, to maintain it as such. Uh, but in more recent times, we have these agreements which have gained their own, their own impetus. Uh, simply by having an agreement there, governments one way or another tend to abide by them uh, and find it difficult uh, to, to just break them when it no longer suits their purposes. So the main focus of, of your book is uh, international climate uh, agreements, but you also start the book by talking about uh, the climate change science in general. And one of, and you've also researched, done a lot of research in this previously, and you've stated that there's always an overstatement of the, the temperature increase and an understatement of the cost. Do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, one, one way or another, the the various international bodies, and it's led by a group called the IPPC, the International uh, IPPC, I can't even remember what it stands for now, but the International the, the, Panel the international, on Climate Change. Yes, yeah, that's right, IPCC. Um, basically, uh, that person, uh, they have had major reports, and very voluminous reports, thousands of scientists are involved, and it's distilled into, into summaries, and the summaries are distilled even further into uh, into press releases um, so that 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 gathers information on what's been happening in the temperature but the main aspect of that information is that it looks at the uh, 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 the, the, the level of temperatures and the, and the association of that with carbon dioxide and it has these models uh, it, it accepts various models of what the temperature levels should be doing and invariably those temperatures are projected uh, have fallen uh, 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 much higher than the outcomes. And then this, this has even been recognized in, only in the last few weeks, actually, by some of the major major uh, proponents of the global warming scare, if you like, who, who now acknowledge that these models are uh, massively outperforming the temperature, if you like, in terms of the heating and uh, and the uh, um, the, the, the lead author of this paper was uh, was uh, Santa, who was basically uh, now the nowadays the doyen of the uh, climate warmest scientists, and uh, but an association uh, associate author Michael Mann, who was very famous for having sued a lot of people, including uh, uh, including Mark Stein for unkind things about him. Um, so basically, there is now. Um, an agreement that these uh, that the, these temperature levels have been higher than have been anticipated, um, 
but there isn't an agreement on why they're higher, and certainly those warmest who've made a career out of the, out of the scare aren't about to start folding, and uh, they're basically saying, well, they made, must, the temperature is hiding in the deep oceans, or or it's, it's a temporary phenomenon, etc. So the, the 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 end product is that the temperatures have been rising, and they've been rising uh, indeed for about a century, two centuries now, um, because of uh, uh, there are underlying. Uh, Typical factor with temperatures, which have been rising uh, since since people stopped ice skating on on, on the Thames in, in the middle of the 19th century, they've been rising since then. Those the early rises are of course something to do with carbon dioxide, but the, the latter rises are are attributed to carbon dioxide. And indeed, there's, a, there's quite a lot of a consensus in 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 one sense on that that the uh, uh, carbon dioxide does there is an association of carbon dioxide with higher temperatures. Uh, the premier uh, new, uh, atmospheric physicist in the world, uh, Richard Linton, um, basically says, well, yes, the, 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 the doubling of the carbon dioxide, which we're likely to see in the next century, uh, will lead to an increase in temperature, probably about one degree Celsius, but that's all. And indeed, most of that one degree Celsius increase has almost certainly already occurred. And uh, also uh, going on to the un understatement of the cost, we're all told that you know we'll uh, have you know cheap, reliable uh, renewables into the future. Uh, that, that's what a lot of these reports say. But as we're finding out, that's hardly the case at all. Oh no, it's certainly not the case. Uh, I mean, we we've seen this very graphically in Australia, uh, where we've uh, implemented the renewable energy target. Which with subsidies to renewable energy, that is to uh, to basically to solar and, and wind, uh, and those subsidies are at the expense of coal. And what the subsidies do is, is drive out coal because they get double, they send double the uh, the revenue per megawatt hour that they produce at the coal power stations, and they operate in a preferred way, which forces the coal power stations to go on and off, on and off, on and off, uh, to fill the gaps. When the wind isn't blowing or the sun isn't shining, so that, that and that creates wear and tear on the power stations, and they are being forced to close as a result of that. And what we find is when they close, catastrophes happen. Um, in September of last year, um, we saw that shortly after uh, the last coal-fired power station in well, in South Australia closed, we saw the whole state go black. Basically, the, the whole state broke, the electricity system broke, because it didn't have a reliable system. The problem with wind is not only is it more costly, it's unreliable. Um, what we saw um, shortly after, earlier this year, and about Christmas time, when uh, when the Hazelwood Power Station was known to be closing, when they did close at the end of March, um, we saw a doubling of the power prices, the, the double, the state double that level. It won't go down now uh, unless put the new power, new coal power, uh, power, power stations are, are built. So the, the answer is those people who say wind is cheaper. Um, the answer is no, obviously it's not. We, we, we've got empirical evidence that it's not. But people have been saying, I've been involved in it for about 30, 35 years almost, uh, the electricity business, and people have been saying since the mid 80s that. Um, within the next five years, wind or solar or combination of that will be uh, on a par with perhaps even cheaper than coal. Uh, and it's never happened. Uh, it needs a subsidy, and the subsidy at the present time in Australia is, is $70. Uh, the price is now $80. $80. It was only $40. The market price was only $40 before the closure of the last major power station at Hazelwood. It's now $80. And the renewable energy people get sixty or seventy dollars on top of that, uh, the by the subsidy which the government forces consumers to pay. Uh, in your view, what's the in terms of uh, your understanding of the climate science? What's the worst case uh, scenario, and is that definitely still better than having all this expensive renewable energy? Well, I, the worst. Case scenario is, is that it will have some increase in temperature more than uh, more than one or two degrees Celsius. Uh, that's the worst case in that scenario. People then say, well, the oceans might start reversing, the currents might start reversing, or or there'll be massive inundation and flooding. None of that is possible. None of that is possible at all. 
the, 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 there are cataclysmic uh, worst case scenarios put forward by some people. That is, uh, in fact, I think uh, um, uh, it, uh, one scientist came forward and saying, well, our, our atmosphere will be similar to that of Venus if uh, Trump has his way, and you know, Trump has, has uh, abandoned the Paris Agreement. Um, you know, the, the, that is actually absurd. Uh, the worst case scenario is that it's warmer. Some places will, will benefit from that warmer uh, uh, temperature. Others won't benefit. Um, it won't, won't make a great deal of difference. The, the Earth's temperature since mankind has been um, made to relevant to the last 50,000 years or so has, has moved up, uh, plus or minus uh, one or two degrees from where we are now. Uh, time without any any apparent harm to mankind. Indeed, usual the harm has usually been when the temperature has fallen rather than has risen. And we've, we've seen things like uh, the dark age, a, ages, and uh, you know, following following that, and the, the medieval cool and cooler period, uh, following the, uh, uh, the warming in the end of about the 12th century. So you know, uh, the, the kind of volatility that we're talking about is unlikely to have any major effect. Some have suggested, well, if it's warm, there'll be more um, uh, cyclones, tropical storms, and, and, and incoming weather. Uh, the evidence of that is, is, is there's no evidence of that whatsoever because the, the, the number of storms have effectively decreased over the past uh, decade or so. Uh, some have said, well, it make a lot of difference in terms of precipitation. You see less rain, and indeed, um, a major, a major uh, hook uh, in the uh, scientist report. Uh, the last one was. The uh, the the uh, drought in, in southeastern Australia, which was supposed to be uh, a permanent occurrence, uh, but the drought, of course, had broken. And uh, and if you look at the rainfall in that period o over the past century since since records have been kept, it's very volatile in Australia, but there's no trend whatsoever. And of course, we've heard for years and years now the, uh, by uh, pro-climate change people that 97% of scientists agree that climate change is real. But of course, uh, that, uh, the study that's uh, based on, or the survey that that's based on, that's not a legitimate uh, study. No, it's a bogus study, and it was based on the uh, University of Queensland study uh, where they, some activists went through uh, thousands of scientists and they uh, had their statements and they ruled out most of them and they were left with about um, uh, 120 or so scientists, which 97% um, of the 120 that they selected, they decided uh, were, were uh, affirmative in the idea that there is global warming. The other aspect, sorry, it was a totally unrepresentative sample, and there are other samples on the website which show, uh, uh, you know, more or less a 50-50 in terms of science, uh, whether they support, whether they agree with global warming or not. But if you ask the question of most scientists, uh, with the with a greater amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, will, will uh, Earth be warmer or cooler? They'll say warmer. Uh, but then the big question is, does that matter? Is it, is it cataclysmic? Is it even harmful? That's the, that's the question which... Um, nobody could be sure about it, but, but hardly, but, but certainly not 97% of scientists think that uh, we're a cataclysmic uh, global warming trend. Now let's turn to what is the main focus of your book, which is these international climate agreements. Now, forcing all countries to commit to uh, an, an agreement is difficult because international law, despite what people say, doesn't really exist. So how have, and obviously started with the Rio summit, the Earth summit in 92, and we've had all these meetings since. So what has been the, the key ways that the UN and all of these other climate change advocacy groups have been able to get nations to uh, not just sign up to these agreements, but make sure they actually follow them? Well, the previous ones were, were just naming and shaming. Uh, essentially, it's the ozone, and there's whaling, and there's migrating birds, and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, sulfur dioxide emissions. All of these kinds of international environmental agreements have been uh, agreed to. None of them are really very costly to nations. None of them cost an awful lot. Uh, and nations, by and large, agree to them. In the ozone, was somewhat costly because it did getting rid of the most efficient um, 
method of, of uh, cooling. Uh, uh, but basically, there, there, there were replacements which were very much more costly. So, you know, the governments sort of sign on and they have, uh, they have some sort of a commitment to it uh, and they may well leave, but and they, 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 the sovereign states of the county, uh, but they, they have a moral impetus to stay in. Now, that doesn't mean to say they all stay in because the, uh, the Kyoto Agreement was, which was the precursor to the Paris Agreement in December uh, 2015. The Kyoto Agreement uh, was not met by some countries. Canada was had a very ambitious target. Uh, Australia did meet it. Um, its target wasn't quite so ambitious, but it really met the, its Kyoto Agreement not by not by reducing emissions of carbon dioxide from fuels, which is the burning route, but by stopping development, stopping clearing of land, uh, and 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 uh, thereby making that land unproductive. Um, and and I might add that the government never compensated any any farmers or landowners for the land that they essentially sterilised. Um, one nation in another position to Australia uh, in terms of its economic structure and its land uh, and, the, and its land extent is Canada. And Canada had this very ambitious uh, set of uh, reductions they were going to make. They couldn't make them. They could have made them had they adopted the expropriatory uh, land policies that Australia adopted. But they thought that that would be unconscionable to steal the money from the farmers, which uh, we, we we in this country readily readily did. And, uh, having said that, um, in, in the in the period beyond there, uh, we, we we now we then failed a, a Copenhagen agreement, where where there was a bit of a push to agree in emission restraints. The the, the the Chinese and Indians decided they weren't going to have that. But Obama and the uh, and the Europeans got together very strongly to uh, make make this sort of agreement, and every, every country had these um, these independent um, goals that they adopted. By and large, countries that agreed to reduce their emissions from uh, to, to the year 2000 levels to uh, by 26 to 28 percent by the year 2030. There were slight variations from various countries on that, but by and large, the developed countries all agreed to that. But, the, but of course, that only uh, only covers uh, covers about 40 percent or so of total world emissions, and and it's a small, it's a declining 40 percent because the big growth areas are those of uh, China and India and, and other developing countries. Uh, so we we had that situation came in there where um, countries independently agreed to, to make these commitments. And as you say, there's no international law, there's no international police force forcing these, these these commitments to be adhered to. But that said, it's very difficult to break them, or at least countries have found it difficult to break them. We now have the situation where the Americans have, have not ratified or de-ratified the, uh, the treaty, the, the Paris Treaty, uh, which means the Americans are about 15% of world emissions, so it means only about 25% Global emissions are actually covered by it now, but the other countries, including Australia, are saying, "No, no, we, we solemnly agreed to do this, and we're going to continue doing it, even though uh, it, it never was very, very effective because it only covered 40 percent, and totally defective now. The Americans have left; it only covers 25 percent. But nonetheless, countries uh, have this ideology that they that they have adopted, and they say, at least for the time being, that they're going to adhere to it, and they're going to they, they're going to meet their Commitments, even though those commitments aren't, aren't uh, international law and not enforceable by the, the same methods that uh, normal law is enforceable. It seems in Australia that we uh, are seeing the consequences of these climate uh, policies uh, probably more than most of the world. There was the uh, story recently that South Australia has the uh, highest power prices in the world, and let's not forget the uh, infamous uh, blackouts. Are we mm -hmm. one of the, the worst countries when it comes to uh, this area of policy in terms of uh, shooting our economy in the foot? Yes, I think it, it does bite harder here than elsewhere. I mean, we, we have moved in the past dozen years from being 
just about the cheapest electricity in the world to one of the dearest. Not, not the dearest, there are, there are other countries we say dearer, but we should easily be the cheapest because we've got so much coal and it's so well situated and it's clean coal as well. You don't have to do much uh, um, sulfur dioxide in it or ash content or very things like that. So it's coal which is which is easily found, it's not very far beneath the surface, and by and large, most of our power stations are located in coal fields and they just they just uh, convey about the coal straight into the ovens and then they, the power goes straight to our ovens and factories. So yes, the, 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 if you're looking at the world leak tech table, if you like, of, of the more expensive power systems in the world, we have moved from expensive just about to somewhere in the top four or five. Uh, now, despite this, our leaders still want to go full steam ahead with more climate change policies. And we just saw the uh, f a review into Australia's energy market by chief scientist Alan Finkel, which was uh, called the, the Finkel Review. Uh, what would that look like if that, that was implemented? It said that our electricity prices would actually um, go down. But what's, what's the real truth of that? Oh, the real truth is it would go quite a lot. I mean, we, we would see the continuation of the trend we have. Um, the, the various proposals that Alan Fingles put forward are, are really just a continuation of the status quo, an intensification. We, we go from uh, the goal of uh, effectively about 15% exotic wind, that is wind and solar renewables uh, in, in 2020, to about 42% in 2030, and it's going to go 70% allegedly in 2050. Uh, and the answer is that these renewables, one, the, we, we can play with this as we want, but one way or the other, renewables are going to cost $100 per megawatt hour, highly unreliable, compared to coal, which is, say, $45 per megawatt hour. So the wholesale price of energy at least doubles as a result of that. And it doesn't more than double because the, the, the renewables do require various ancillary services, um, and backup services, to compensate for their in 80 regularity, and that would would add a premium. The, the minister, Josh Frandenberg, has suggested that the premium that these renewables require is, a, is about 18% uh, of their cost, but that's a very conservative assessment because it, it, it is based on being able to um, uh, buy, uh, buy insurance for a quarter of their out for a minute for, a, uh, for about four hours. Now, when the wind stops blowing, it often stops blowing for days and days on end. So that is totally inadequate. Nonetheless, it is a recognition that wind not only is expensive, but has additional costs as well. And those costs, in the end, the more wind comes into the, into the system, the more those costs are reflected in the price we pay. Now, given that we're, we're seeing the negative consequences of all these climate policies, higher electricity bills and uh, blackouts, obviously the, the people don't want that, but our leaders somewhat feel pressured into continuing climate action on both sides of the political spectrum, both Liberal and Labor. And it's worth pointing out that Tony Abbott, uh, when he was in opposition campaigning against the carbon tax, he still felt obliged to say that climate change is real, uh, man, uh, man contributes to it. So why, why is this such such a devotion from our politicians to go down this course of action uh, when there's obviously we're seeing all the these negative consequences manifest well I think the politics is responding to public opinion and, and we've had this this storm of, of propaganda for many many years saying that coal is dirty we have to get out of this we have to have this more modern stuff winds and whatever uh, and anybody who disagrees with that basically wants to fry children. And the politicians really are responding to that. We have very few politicians who you might say are leaders. Uh, Tony Abbott certainly is one now. He's now in opposition. He's now calling this a myth and, and, a, and a very destructive myth. Uh, Donald Trump certainly was one who had, had the same view, has the same view, not only has the same view, but acted on that view. But you can find very few elsewhere in the world that, the Indian politicians are certainly uh, are very cynical about it all and think it's, it's, it's rubbish, but it's not their business and uh, it's not, they're not being asked to do very much. The Chinese are equally cynical 
Uh, they're not doing anything at all, but they pay a service to, to the government for various reasons. And yet, so the answer is that I, I speak to many MPs on the, uh, on the conservative side of politics, people like, and some of whom actually think that it's, it's total rubbish, but they're not about to do anything about it because they, they, they figure that they won't get re-elected. So the, oh, the, only, the only political parties that basically call them the town of minor parties, like, like One Nation, um, the Australian Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats, uh, they're basically saying, it's absurd, the whole party is a, is a freak and not, and not going to be worth pursuing, it's, uh, and it's extremely damaging. There are others in the coalition with a similar view, but they're, 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 uh, they're muted partly by the leader and partly by their trust. Uh, it's, uh, you say that uh, it's public opinion that's uh, caused all this action, but yeah, I, I still doubt that. Uh, I still think that if we had a leader who was brave enough to say that this is madness, we're going, not going to do it, they, they might be surprised you know, at the electoral outcome, because let's not forget that Tony Abbott won the 2013 election promising to axe the carbon tax, and that was basically mm. what propelled him to office. Quite right, a bit, you know, and and uh, he, he was proven to be correct. And that, uh, you know, a sound move on his part. I, I don't know the business of politics as such, but you know, the politicians, the ones, at least the ones that that, that uh, President Trump says are in the swamp, which is the vast majority of them, they all feel whether or not they think this is a, a real. Uh, they, they all feel that it would be electorally damaging for them to come out and say, this is rubbish, the campaign against it. My old boss, who's the leader of the, uh, the Liberals in Western Australia, Han, I don't think he comes out and says, this is, this is rubbish, we're going we're gonna to negate the whole thing. Uh, I'm sure he does think it's rubbish. But, uh, you know, what, one, you know what, even the politicians who, uh, like, who think like I do, and I think like, they say, like you do, basically are reluctant to come out and say we will therefore campaign against it. Those who campaign against it tend to do so on the periphery by saying, well, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll limit the damage of this and, uh, and the storm will blow over by about 2020 and we can get back to business as usual. Now, your book is called uh, yeah, Climate Change, Trees and Policies in the, the Trump Era, and obviously Trump has somewhat uh, changed the debate. Uh, he spoke that he, uh, before the election that he wanted to tear up the, the Paris Agreement. He's followed through with that and with, withdrawn the United States from that. Do you think that this will have a profound shift on the debate and policies around climate change now that the United States has basically rejected the alleged climate change consensus? It must do. Uh, we have next week the G20 meeting, and the G20 uh, uh, draft uh, at least in various parts, and it's already watered down very considerably from what it was supposed to be originally. Uh, so Trump, if America actually says, we're not going to do this, we are not going to... Uh, uh, constrain our energy industry and, and, and make sure we're high-cost energy producers, uh, we're going to stop doing that. The rest of the world has to follow, because the penalty for not doing so is industry mig migrates to the United States. The, you know, the, we're already seeing the car plants in Germany uh, and various other industries moving to the U.S. from, from Europe because energy prices are cheaper there. And that will come even more so in the future and uh, would be a, 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 if the real world doesn't change its policies, the U.S. will be a magnet for the, the industries that they value. We can see that this in Australia. We've already seen with the higher prices that, that have been uh, forced upon us over the last seven or eight years by the renewables policy uh, has already led to the closure of smelters and to other smelters being being hard to close. Uh, we, we can we can be pretty sure here in Australia that the um, the industries which are the energy intensive and uh, internationally competitive industries we have, that's uh, aluminium smelting, other, other forms of smelting, iron and steel, chemicals, these industries uh, will migrate from Australia. There will be no question about it. They, they will survive when the price of their energy, uh, wholesale energy, uh, down as it, as it already has and will go even further higher. 
Oh, we certainly hope that in the new f future we have some politicians and leaders in Australia who are willing to uh, follow the lead on Trump. But that's all we've got time for. So thank you, Ellen, for coming on the show today and helping us to understand what sometimes is a complex and te technical topic. Thank you, Tim. Let's be in the show. Uh, and of course, I'd encourage all of our listeners to uh, buy Alan's book from our friends at uh, Connor Court Publishing. Uh, so, as, as always, at the end of the show, uh, the usual reminders apply. Uh, please don't forget to sign up to the email list at theunshackled.net slash subscribe. Uh, we also have Unshackled merchandise for sale at uprightmarket.com. Uh, please consider supporting the work on The Unshackled. You can come uh, Patreon on Patreon, and you can also, which includes a discount on Connor Court's books, so you can get a discount for Alan's book if you want to. And, of course, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast. You can do so on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, or view the video version on YouTube. And, of course, don't forget to keep visiting theunshackled.net on a regular basis for all the latest news. Thanks once again for listening, and we'll see you next time.